Have you ever wondered what it takes to get along with people who just drive you crazy, who you just can't seem to get along with? That's what we'll talk about today. The most important single ingredient in the formula of success is knowing how to get along with people. Theodore Roosevelt. Today, we're going to talk about the book, People Can't Drive You Crazy If You Don't Give Them the Keys by Dr. Mike Bechtel. This book grabbed me right away, primarily because of the title. How many times do we have problems in our lives where we hand the keys over to the very thing or the very people who keep us from doing our best or keep us from being able to just survive? And so when I saw this book and I thought that's exactly right, this book is primarily talking about how you deal with people that are hard to deal with and what you can do in order to get along better with them. But not just that, how to even just stand up for yourself without being the bad guy or the villain in the story. Sometimes people who affect you in the most negative ways don't mean to do it or have issues in their own lives that cause them to go down this direction. So a little bit of compassion is understandable, but where do you draw the line so you can still be you? He says that we just live in a world that just makes us crazy. Our kids are crying, we're rushing back and forth, and everything just feels out of control from time to time. And at some point, you can feel, everyone is just making me crazy. I can't live with all these people around me. It could be in the home, it could be at work, it could be with our children or our children's school. All sorts of people add drama into our lives. But how do we get past that so we can actually, first of all, be happy, and second of all, have great relationships with people, even if they are doing this to us? And the bottom line is that we all have people in our lives that we disagree with, we feel there's a lot of drama involved with them, or that we can't have rational relationships with them. There are very few people who just glide through life with perfect relationships and nothing ever goes wrong. He says that we have this emotional place where we feel pretty in control of our lives, we're comfortable with it, but if we leave the area where we're comfortable, chances are it's because someone else pushed us out of that comfort zone. And in the end, it's drama, anything that makes us feel unsettled. And he says, we assume that life would be better without all the drama. We can't really do that. We live in a world with people with different agendas, different ideas of what's right and wrong, different thoughts about it. And now what we will tolerate with people has drastically gone down. Before, we'd break off relationships with people if they were in jail or did some horrible crime. But now we'll break off relationships with people because we disagree with them on all sorts of topics. Our level of what we will accept from others is no longer at a place where we can have decent relationships with anybody because there's all sorts of ways that people are going to disagree with us. And the question is, is can we have relationships with people we disagree with and still have that comfort level in our own lives? And to be honest with the whole situation, it's not really what other people are doing to us. It's what we do in reaction to what those people are doing to us. Are we calling it quits on all sorts of relationships because we can't tolerate what they're doing? Do we yell at people? Do we correct people? Do we put them in their place? That's a fun thing, right? Particularly on the internet. We're going to put them in their place. We're going to put the smack down on them so that they can't even begin to live their lives. And that's not how a society or a family or a group of people works at all. We don't have to react in such a way to everyone we meet. Because in the end, we think the other people are causing drama, but it turns out we're the ones that are causing drama. And he said that the way we can tell things are going awry is that, first of all, when something involves our emotions, and I think that's the root of why everything is making us crazy, because we used to be able to disagree about all sorts of things, but we didn't get emotional about it. Now everything's emotional. You triggered me. I have to recover from what you did. We drag our emotions into everything. Then the second point is it usually involves other people. When you're not around other people, not much drama really happens. In the pandemic, when people were more isolated, I think they got used to this level of no drama and then decided to take it out on the internet. And then when we started getting back together again, 
started taking it out on our families, our friends, and other people around us. The third item, he says, is that when something is unexpected, it shocks us. That's when we get the most upset. So if we think we know where a relationship is going or something is happening and suddenly it's shocking, now we're upset. And that unexpectedness really makes it much worse. And then he said the fourth issue is when things are personal. That might be, too, why we try to tear everyone down so much more than we used to, because now everything is personal to us. We can't just say, oh, I agree to disagree or I respect your opinion. I just don't happen to believe that way. But now we've made everything personal. And then the fifth item is that he says it's exaggerated. You're the devil. And all the other types of names we call people that we don't really mean. We don't think other people are the devil. We don't think other people are bad people. We just disagree in the end. But it's that exaggeration that tears our relationship apart. A lot of us feel uncomfortable about it because we like to have control over our lives and control over everything that goes in our lives. We like to know that our little worlds are perfectly ordered, and that is not how the world works. Our worlds, our existence, our families, our friends are not ordered people. And he said that what we do that ends up being wrong and how we react to other people is we decide that we're going to change other people. We're going to change them. We're going to say that magic sentence that allows them to see that they were wrong. We were right. They'll go, oh, yeah, you're right. I get it. And our decision to change other people or change the situations or even this belief that we can change other people is really devastating to almost every relationship we have. And then the last way we react is we just leave the situation. Maybe we storm out. Maybe we break off that relationship. And that way, we no longer have this drama in our lives. But we also no longer have other people in our lives. When someone storms out on us, that's the end of the conversation. It's not a beginning of a conversation. It's not the beginning of reconciliation. It's the end. So he says that when you analyze the situation, the first question you have to ask yourself, is there something I can do about this? Maybe can you change the situation itself? And his example, everyone's at your house for Thanksgiving, and that sort of pushes you into a pressure situation. Maybe instead of that, could there just be a Thanksgiving meal at a restaurant where it's a shorter period of time, there's less stress involved with it, and now you've taken the punch out of the big event? Then he says the next question is, if you can't change the situation, can you change you so that you have a better viewpoint about what's going on? Can you change your attitude about it so you're not angry You're letting it roll off you so that you can have a good night. And in the end, if we can't change that situation, if we can't change our attitudes, then maybe we do have to just quit. But that third reaction is really where we have to carefully consider, because when you have that, it's hurtful to everybody. That is the end of relationships. And so when you decide that you can't participate in something It's over with. And are you really willing to risk all your family members, all your relationships, your friends, just because you can't figure a way of changing your own attitude? And he gives a quote from Martin Luther. You might not be able to stop the birds from landing on your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. So you can't end drama in your life, but you can also change it in such a way that it's not so detrimental to yourself and other people. He says in the end that part of our problem is, is that we think we're right. We always believe that we're right. I mean, obviously, if we thought we were wrong, we would change our beliefs. So we walk around certain about everything we believe. And the question is, is first of all, is there no room for error in our own perspectives? Could we be wrong? Maybe if we're not wrong, maybe that other person's perspective has some merit to it as well. I've seen very few issues in this world where another person, if you actually listen to them, wouldn't have some merit in their beliefs, some reason that they believe the thing that they believe. The problem is, he says, is that we get a lot of satisfaction about the fact that we're right. If you look at it, everyone wants to believe what they want to believe, and they want to believe they're right. 
And what we do is we filter all the information that's coming in to meet our expectations. So if we believe something is true and we are confronted with information that says maybe what we're saying is not true, we filter that out immediately. We'll say, well, that must be faulty data. That must be something that they did wrong. Clearly, they're not looking at it in the right way. So we don't even investigate things that go against our opinion because we just want to be able to be right and not have conflicting information. And he says that it's more healthy for us to sometimes give perspective to a situation. Maybe you don't have all the facts and you also made some assumptions. Maybe you decided that all of your assumptions are amazingly accurate and you're right most of the time. And then you base all your emotions on the fact of how right you are. It's problematic to believe that our perspective is always true and is always the correct choice. And to then label anyone who goes against our perspective as being wrong, creating drama, and someone I can no longer have a relationship with. And so when we look at things through our perspective, we're going to judge everyone and everything against it. And then even worse, we think that we could go to that other person and change their beliefs. We think we can say the magic sentence that will suddenly make them go, oh, you're right. I've been wrong my whole life. Or, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to change my entire perspective on everything I believe about something that's core to my belief. It's very hard to change other people's opinions. And I don't even think that we're in a right place in a society where many of us can do that. Nobody is willing to give up on their hardcore beliefs anymore. And until we start to learn to question our own assumptions and look at things with a good, clean, open-mindedness, we're not going to change other people's lives. They're not going to change our lives either. And so then we're going to be stuck in these relationships where we can't get along. What comes about, too, is that we believe that we can read each other's minds. So if someone says something that we disagree with, we can immediately decide that the reason that they don't agree with us is because they're bad people or they follow bad people. They listen to this person. They read this book. It's not my friend who's a bad person. All their influences are bad people, too. And they have no point. They have no perspective. And there's no reason to believe anything that they say or the people that they like say. So I'm just going to rule it out entirely. And we can't read people's minds at all. We love to think we can. We see bubbles over their heads telling us exactly how, what kind of an awful person they are and what a true and kind-hearted person I am. But in the reality of things, we don't have that ability. Do they have that ability to do it for us and just not assume that we're bad people because we disagree with them? And this is where he says relationships come in. This is the part where the heart of the relationship is really where we meet in really deep and meaningful ways. It's not so much that relationships work because we agree with each other on everything or that we see the same sources as being respectable. And some of the best and deepest relationships are those relationships who are willing to challenge us and challenge what our thinking is. And he says that the more we connect with people and really look at that person in an honest way and listen to them, that's when that relationship blooms. It makes it more meaningful in our lives. We end up being closer to people, happy in our own lives, and willing to step out in our own beliefs and listen to other people. Our life becomes richer when we're willing to accept others. He says that there's a myth about relationships. One, You can convince other people of facts and then they will change their minds. Two, that you won't be happy until this person believes what you believe and you can fix them. Boy, have you ever tried to fix someone? That is a bad way to go in your life. We also sometimes believe that it takes two to fix a relationship, but sometimes it takes one person to fix a relationship. We could be that person. We could be the person who brings peace back into our relationship. And then the last fallacy that we have is that if we just be a little bit more patient, they'll come around and see my point of view. And you know what? It may never happen. And we have to come to grips about the fact that they may never agree with us. Are we willing to continue on that relationship? So he says that in reality, 
The people who we spend the most time with are the ones who create the most drama in our lives. Makes sense, right? The second thing we know is that relationships take work. And also, it takes time, he says, that it's not something we're going to fix in a day, that relationships are about the long term. He says to remember that the past isn't an indicator of what our future is going to be. If we've had a rocky time with someone, doesn't mean we're going to continue to have a rocky time in the future. And then the last part, and this one is important, is that we don't have to be a victim. If we are really in a bad spot with a person and they're honestly damaging us through their statements and their actions, we don't have to stay there and take it. If a relationship is truly toxic, we can walk away from that. We can actually get out of those relationships. But those are, again, the truly toxic ones. That's not, you just agree with the color of the sky today, so therefore I can no longer be in a relationship with you. I saw it all sorts of different ways in the probably the last decade where people on Facebook would say, well, if you believe X, don't be my friend anymore. Just unfriend me. Do we have to fight over everything? Or can we find a place in our heart where we can have relationships, maybe with rules, of people who don't agree with us? And in order for us to get those relationships to get better, we have to have hope that they will get better. We have to be able to know that things can improve. And I talk about this, you know, in terms of, you know, even friendships, people saying that they're going to quit and you can no longer be their friends. But in some of the cases, there are relatives, our parents, our siblings. Are we going to quit our siblings because we disagree? Are we no longer going to talk to our parents because we don't agree with them on something? There are people who are meant to be in our lives. And if we just quit with them, they won't be in our lives and our lives will be less for it, even if at times they add drama to our lives. He says the most important thing is that we realize what we can control and what we can't. And it is unhealthy for us to either be in a relationship that's toxic where we're at their mercy, where we hope that they treat us properly and they're not going to. It's also unhealthy for us to sit there and think that we have control over other people's lives, too. Both of them are a bad direction. And once we focus on what we can do, once we focus on taking responsibility for what he says are our own choices, then we have clarity in the situation. If someone really damages you because of the drama, do you decide that you can't be in a relationship with them? Or do you decide to limit the amount of time or maybe throttle the location so that things can't get out of control? People are a lot more well-behaved in restaurants than they are maybe at your house. And so can you, within your own control, do something to alter the relationship to make it better? Even if you realize at the beginning that you cannot change that other person, all you can do is change your own reaction to that person. And in reality, people do change. That person who makes you have a lot of drama in your life, they might change. But the problem is, is that we cannot demand it happens. We can't necessarily expect it happens, but we can be pleasantly surprised if it does. We cannot force other people to change. And he says there's all sorts of things that we cannot change. What other people's beliefs are, we can't change the weather, but there are things we can change. And that's essentially who we spend time with, what we do with our time and our money, where we see other people. And in the end, he says, quote, what can we control ourselves? What can we not control? Everything else. And we believe that everybody else's actions are angry, malicious, trying to damage us, trying to damage other people, trying to destroy the world. and. We are as pure as the driven snow. We believe everything out of the goodness of our own hearts. We are smart. We're well-read. We have great opinions. We research everything. And we do things out of the most kind, benevolent thing possible. And as long as we stick to that particular attitude, we'll never try to figure out how to come up with a middle ground or at least a working place for us to get along with other people. They're bad, we're good, that's the end of it. And he says that in order to get to that spot, communication is the key. 
And so what we have to do is take time to understand the other person, to see where they're coming from, and try to realize that they have thoughtful reasons too. They aren't malicious. We're not malicious. We're all trying to just get along in this world and find the best path forward. It's hard because we see everything through our own lens. There's an old joke that talks about fish being in a pond. And one fish says to the other fish, well, what do you think about the water in this pond? And the other fish goes, water? What's water? And that's because that fish lives in the water. There's no seeing outside of the water. It's everything to them. And so is there a world outside the water? No. To that fish, inside the water is everything. And that's the same thing with our own views. Inside our own brain, it's everything. We're great. We're wonderful. And everything outside of it's bad or malicious or malevolent or something that's going to come after us. And that's where we have to notice that perspective and thinking outside of our own world a little bit will help us get better relationships with people. And so what we can only hope for when we don't change people's minds is that we can hope to be something influential in their lives. If you have ever met someone who's addicted to something, you're not going to change them. If you found people who get angry and have rage issues, you're not going to change them either. But can you be an influence that moderates the behavior or at least around you prevents that from happening? That's the best that you can really hope for when you're talking about what you can do when other people are just making you crazy. Be a good influence on them. And that might mean that when they rage and they anger and they yell, you don't yell back. You stay calm and you say the thing that tries to calm down the situation. And I'm not going to get all bible on you, but there is a passage that has been a ruler in my life. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You don't start fights with people. You don't try to beat them over the head. And if taking a kind word, if staying quiet for a moment, or thinking of a different way to react to people, allows you to be at peace with someone else, that's the right way to go. He says it's important that we realize that there's a difference between expectations and expectancy. And that means that expectations are where we get into trouble. I expect you to change. I expect you to view things my way. That's really the wronger way to do it. He says the healthier person comes when someone has expectancy instead. And that means I don't know what's going to happen and that you're not demanding or insisting on a particular action to happen and that you really don't know how it's going to turn out. He says in the end, you have to just watch and see what happens next because it's when we have that expectation that it causes us to damage our relationships. And when we get into those situations, we have to really take our brain off of what he calls autopilot. Our autopilot is what gets us into trouble, too. We react. We say something. We demand that somebody else changes. And when we stop having that automatic or at least filter that automatic reaction we have to other people, that's when growth can happen. And that's when that relationship can be saved. When you decide that you're going to have influence in another person's life instead of demanding they change, that's when we get healthier. We get mentally more stable. I'm going to be a good influence on this person. And I'm going to act in the way that I wish other people would treat me too. That influence aspect makes us happier and it builds up trust in the relationship because that other person knows too, you're not going to beat them over the head about everything you disagree with. He says in the end, we can't choose our family, we can't fire our family, and we can't get rid of our family. These are the people that have been with us our whole lives and is a part of us. It's terrible when I see people say, oh, I no longer talk to my family because they believe in X, Y, Z. That is the nuclear option. That is the decision you make that ends it all. And it's damaging to everyone around you. And he says that the reason that these family relationships are so hard to get along with is, first of all, they're with us our whole lives. We have a long time history with them. They are close to us. They usually live maybe in the same town or same area with us. We have 
patterns of behavior that we've built up over all those decades of time that we spent with that person. So now we've fallen into a rut of behavior and there's a lot of emotion tied up into it. And that's why families, more than anything, really screw up our ability to get along with them more than anything else. So what we can do is we can just decide, again, that it's not our job to fix the other person. We know other people can change. We're just not going to count on it. And as much as we can, we're going to be a good influence in the situation. We can do things like hope and pray and avoid being a victim of this particular relationship. Just because we're going to have a relationship with our family doesn't mean that we have to be victims of the family either. And in the end, we need to realize that if we end the relationship, that's a terrible answer. We need people and we need our community, even if there's drama involved in it. And so he says that we have to quote, we need to talk to the person, not talk about them. And so that also means ending gossip about them. If you're having a hard time with them and you're sitting on the phone with siblings complaining about that other person, is it possible that you could just talk to the other person and say, when this happens, it makes me very upset because you're yelling at me or you talk past me or whatever it is that is the drama point and talk to that person to see if there's a way we could disagree, but not in a toxic way. So this is the first part of our podcast where we're talking about other people and how we can find ways of coping with other people. In the next podcast, we're going to talk about what can we do to change our own lives and change how we can be better with other people. So my challenge to you is to identify one relationship that could use a little attention and see, is it possible you can change the circumstance of how and where and when you meet to take a little bit of the punch out of the situation? Write down that relationship and write down three things you could do that might mitigate some of the annoying drama that you have between you. And now our fun entertainment advice of the week comes from Uncle Buck. Hey, how you doing? Who are you? I'm your Uncle Buck. Do I have an uncle? Unfortunately. Ooh. Holy smokes. He's cooking our garbage. Say, hey, where's your, um, your sister, um, uh... Her name is Maisie. Maisie. For the second time. Sorry. You must be hungry. Just for you. Oh, my God. He put onions in the eggs. I'm gonna go check on Maisie. I'll fix you some cereal when I get back. ask you something. What? Is your sister always this pleasant? No, she's usually in a bad mood in the morning. Ah, that was John Candy and Macaulay Culkin. What a great movie that is. And it shows you the importance of family, even if they do make you a little bit crazy. He was able to assess that she didn't like him. And he tried to figure out ways to repair the relationship. Maybe not in the best ways, but he tried really hard. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you being out there. If you think about it, please leave a review and make sure that you tell other people that they can remove the drama in their life through small steps. 